of courage. The power of courage. Many, many people lack what is called courage. In, on November the 16th, 2010, President Obama gave the Medal of Honor um, to Salvatore uh, Ginta. I guess I pronounced that right. I don't guess it really matters, but it's a difficult name. But nonetheless, he presented this Medal of Honor to him, and when he had the opportunity, because he had risked his life to save others, and, and many people get the Medal of Honor, you know, awarded to their family after they gave their life in the ultimate sacrifice. And, but this man actually lived through uh, the, the ordeal. And when the president awarded him and he had an opportunity to speak, he said, I'm not really a hero. He said, I didn't do anything more than what another reasonable human being would have done had they been where I was at when it happened. In other words, heroes don't often classify themselves as heroes. They don't really think about it like, I, I, I'm, you know, the Mac Daddy here. They don't really think that I'm the stud here. They just feel like something had to be done and somebody needs to take action. I'll never forget watching um, on, on, I don't remember what channel it was, but uh, it was emergencies that was taking place. And it was a ski lift, and I don't remember where it was at, but it was a hundred and some odd feet above the ground. And uh, on the ski lift, there was a mother and two children. And the little girl somehow slipped underneath the bar, and she had on a big jacket, and it had the, you know, the wool and all this stuff. And she slipped, and her mother caught the jacket. The ja she was sliding out of the jacket, and, and mom is screaming frantically, and she's holding on to her. It looked like maybe a four- or five-year-old kid. And uh, mom is, she's getting weary, she's getting tired, but she can't seem to pull her back up through the bar. And there was a bystander on the ground, and he looked up there, and there was a tower here, and suppose the next tower would be, I don't know, uh, several feet down, you know, from there. And he looked, and on that tower, there was, um, you had to get so high, but there was, there was ladder rungs. And as he watched and he contemplated and he saw that that mother could not pull her child back up and the baby was slipping and mama was screaming and, and, and if the baby were to fall, there's no doubt, more than likely, unless somebody heroically and miraculously caught the child, it would die. And this guy just ran and dove as high, high as he could and he caught the ladder and he pulled himself up and he shimmied up that pole like it was nothing. I mean, nobody's business. He didn't have a lanyard. He didn't have safety lines. He, he grabbed on the rollers where the, the sky lift goes over these rollers and he crossed out there, grabbed the, and he's just, he's just going for it. He gets there and he shimmies down the ski lift, reaches over the rail and grabs the child and pulls her back. Mom is ecstatic and excited and you know, when he got down, they interviewed him. He said, man, what in the world was you thinking? You didn't have a safety lanyard. You didn't have nothing, no harness. He said, I just didn't think about it. All I could see was this baby that's going to fall, and I had to do something. It took courage to do it. Many, many people stood around and watched, but this guy said, I can't stand here and do nothing. I got to try. And so I want to talk with you about courage, and, and courage is something that, that many people do not have. Uh, there are many people that just, they're not going to get involved. They're just going to kick back and just hope something happens, hope it works out. Well, I, kinda, I, I, I hope you don't drop your daughter. You know, I hope, you know, and then there's people that says, no, I, I can't live with myself if I let this happen. I've got to jump into action. I've got to do this. It reminds me of a story that was told of uh, General Stonewall Jackson when he found himself on this side of the river and all of his men and his artillery and all that he had, and he needed to be on the other side of the river. And so he called all of his wagon men together, the wagoneers and all this, and he says, listen, guys, I need you to get with the engineers and devise a plan to build us a bridge to get all of our equipment and everything across the river because we need to be on that side. And so the wagoneers told the, the, the engineers about it and said, we need this to happen. But they immediately got together and they started looking for logs and rocks 
and fence material and posts and, and whatever they could find, and they gathered it all up. And the next morning when uh, uh, General Jackson awoke, all of the artillery and all of the, uh, the troops and everybody had crossed the river, he come on and crossed the river on this bridge, and um, he says, where are the engineers? And the wagon men said, they're still in their tent drawing plans to build a bridge. You see, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, if the Lord will help me. There is a difference in people that will take the courage and do something and those who will spend forever and a day planning and never do it. I heard a story one time of this uh, institute of uh, fishing. And in this institute of fishing, they built this 10-story building and this is a place where they studied how to fish. They studied how to catch fish. They studied what fish eat. They studied where fish dwelt. They studied all about the ecosystems of fish and all of this. And they had seminars on fish. And they learned about fish. And they taught about fish. And they, they taught about the best um, uh, rods and reels and the best boats and motors and all of these things. The problem was they never fished. And what I'm saying is you can have all the plans in the world. And I believe in planning. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying just, you know, just fly by the seat of your pants. You know me. I believe in planning. But there comes a point in time when you have done some planning, you don't have to plan until it's perfect because you're never going to do it. Are you hearing me? If you're a hunter and you're waiting on the absolute perfect shot, they come along once in a while. But for you hunters, you realize you got to take what you're given you got to take what's there, what is available. You hear about pitchers sometimes saying, and football players sometimes saying, uh, baseball players that are hitting, you you got to you got to hit what you're given. I mean, if the ball is low and outside and that's all you're getting, then you got to try to hit it or walk. Are you with me? So you got to work with what you got. The thing is, there are those who will talk and plan forever and never do anything about it. Um, a Greek philosopher said that heaven will never help a man that will not act, that will not do something. You know what the Bible tells us? That we are to do what we can do, and he'll help us do what we can't do. You see, actions, my mother used to tell me, son, actions speak louder than words. And at some point, we have got to, to quit thinking about it, quit planning about it, quit going on and on about it, and kicking the ball around the room and finally just start doing it. Nike had a slogan that said, just do it. You know, in other words, we've got enough plans, we've got enough of it. And I'm not, please help me, uh, or please understand me, I'm not against planning. But there's a time and a place when, you, when you've got to move on. Until somebody pulls the trigger or until somebody presses the button, it's not going to happen. If you ever pay close attention to people, you'll find that many times, many people will do everything in the world except have the courage to take action. Let me give you an example. They will talk about an action. They will plan an action. They will prepare. They will organize. They will dream about. They will seek wise counsel. They will investigate. They will invest. But when... They'll almost do anything except, okay, today is the day. Strap yourself in and push the button and let's blast off. Y'all with me? Uh, reminds me of another fellow. His name was Larry Walters. He was 33, year old, 33 years old. And he wanted to see his neighborhood from a different perspective. So one day he come home from work and he stopped by his local Army Navy surplus store and he got him 45 of those weather balloons. He come home and with the help of some of his friends and a little liquid courage, they blew up 45 helium balloons. He had strapped himself to a lawn chair. He wanted to get a different perspective and so now armed with his BB gun and a six-pack of beer, and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, he lifted off. His idea was that once I get up, it'll probably take me about 100 feet, 
And he said, once I, I, I get to, to there, I'll just start picking off one balloon at a time, and slowly I'll let myself. Now, you know, this guy was probably from Brown Town or something. I mean, <laughs> y'all forgive me. Anyway, he had this idea that he'll pick off one of them balloons and that he'll slow himself down. What he didn't realize was he took off, and not did he just go 100 feet. He went 200, 300, 400, 500. He finds himself at 1,100 feet and drifting over the final approach to LAX International Runway. Control Tower sees this. They shut down all traffic in and out of LAX for hours. Flights are backed up all over the United States because of what's happening at LAX. Are you hearing me? He stays airborne for several hours. He finally shoots some balloons, and uh, he finally lands. Of course, the authorities meet him. Uh, you know, he is sighted. Without a doubt, he has caused all kind of a ruckus across the city and across the country. So they begin to ask him a question. They said, number one, uh, were you scared? And he said, yes. They said, will you ever do this again? And he said, no. And they said, well, why did you do it? He said, because I just can't sit there and do nothing. Now, I'm not asking you to stop by the Army-Navy tomorrow and pick up 45 air balloons or, or, or weather balloons, but what this guy said, I want to see my neighborhood from a different perspective, and I'm going to do something about it. I don't know why he didn't just go climb the water tower or something, you know, but uh, this was pretty drastic. But nonetheless, I have to give him an A for his courage. Amen? I, I don't know how long he planned about this thing and thought about this thing, but... He decided, I'm going to get after it. Here's what I want you to understand. This. You need to, to write this down. Procrastination is the assassin of opportunity. And procrastination is the opposite of courage. Did you hear me? I'm going to do this one day. I'm going to do this. Matter of fact, i got a slide I'd like to show you, if I may. Um, and perhaps because it mentions the days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Someday is not one of the days of the week. Y'all hear me? So I'm tired of hearing someday we're going to do that. Huh? Someday. No, I need to hear on Thursday or on Friday, or Monday, or something like that. In other words, if, if we don't finally get to a place where we start, listen, I've been talking all year about goals, about strategy. You say, well, one day I'm going to go back to school. One day I, I'm going to do, someday I'm going to, one day and someday is not part of the week. So are you going to register tomorrow, or is it going to be Monday? Hello? Well, I, I'm going to go back and do this when? Uh, next Wednesday? Next Thursday? What, uh, what is the next step or the next stepping stone in the place toward doing it? Because some days not one of the days of the week. So you've got to say, hey, listen, opportunity comes along. And some people say it only knocks once. I don't really believe that. That's a little bit outside of my scope. Um, I believe opportunities come, but when they come, you've got to take advantage of them. Let me read a little scripture. It comes out of um, the book of Joshua, chapter number 1. And I'm just going to read this, um, if I may, in the New Living Translation. It says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. Israelites across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. Now, how would you like that when the Lord come to you and he just, you know, just real quick, he summons you to the temple and he says, uh, Moses, my servant's dead. <laughs> the leader that's been leading Israel for the last 40 years is dead and gone, and now you are the man. That's why I've had you hanging out with him all this time. Because now, it's kind of like if, you like, if you watch baseball, 
when the coach comes out there and he says, I'm making a pitch and change, guess what? The guy on the mound is done with. Well, Moses was done with, and God says, I'm bringing him on home. And he's called for the bullpen, and just so happened Joshua was in the bullpen. And that's who, and so there comes a time, and that was his day. Let, let's read on a little bit more. He said, um, uh, I, promise to, I promise you what I promised Moses, whatever you set your foot to, uh, you will be on land that I have given you from the Negev. Um, he says, to the wilderness in the south, to the Lebanon mountains in the north of the Euphrates River in the east, from the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hivite or the Hittites, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you and as I was with Moses, and I will not fail you or abandon you. Verse 6, you got this one? Be strong and courageous. Now, if you read that first chapter, you're going to find there's going to be, in fact, not only right there, but on through the first part of Joshua, you're going to find what God is telling him is Moses has died, and you need to mourn him, and there's a period of grieving, but it is time to get off your bottom and get moving. Someone said, well, man, I tried something, Pastor, and I just, I really wanted to go back and get that degree. I really wanted to finish my school, and I really wanted to make my marriage work. I really wanted this. I really wanted that, and it didn't work out. Well, I'm sorry. You've learned one way that ain't going to work. And so now you go put your nose back to the grindstone and figure what's next. See, failure is not falling down. Failure is refusing to get back up. So let me move on. So he says, be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land that I swore to the ancestors to give them. He said, be strong and very courageous. Have a lot of courage. Remember what I said? Courage is the opposite of procrastination. There was another place, and man, I wish I could pull it right out of my head right now, but they were circling a mountain and the Lord spoke and said, how long will you circle this mountain? It is time to go up. Amen? There comes a time when you've got to quit talking about it and let's go for it. All right. So let me go on. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful. Obey all the instructions Moses gave you to do. Do not deviate from them, uh, turning either to the right or the left. Then... You will be, did you catch that? Then, then. So um, he says, when you do these things, then you'll be successful in everything you do. There's a whole lot of people wanting to be successful in everything they do, but not doing all the things that God mentioned that we need to do in order to be successful in everything we do. Study the book of instruction continually, meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, there again, only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I want to tell you something. God is with us wherever we go. He, he's not abandoned us when we get on the job tomorrow. He has not left us if we went to the mountains or down to the sea. He is with us wherever we are. And so no matter what we face in life, he is there to sustain us. So, um, so many people, I don't think it's that they're lazy. I don't think it's that they lack drive or passion. I just think they're scared. I think they're afraid to take a chance. Afraid to jump off of the diving board, so to speak. The, the, the reality of the world that we live in is that nothing will happen until somebody does something. So thinking and praying and planning and all of these things have their place. But until you grab the shovel and start digging the ditch, nothing happens. I believe that we can say, oh God, now I've thought about things. I have consulted you. I've got wise counsel. I have prayed about it. I have done all these things. And now I'm going to put my hand to the plow. And I'm asking you to help me now get this done. 
And there are things throughout the Scripture that did not just fall in place until leaders or people decided, now I will start walking in the promise and see what God has. You know, we live in a society, we won't sign contracts before we ever start. Show me a contract that says what's going to happen on April the 30th and on September the 10th and show me everything. Well, God spoke to, to Abram and said, Get thee out of thy country and from among thy kindred. Well, where are we going, God? Unto a place that I'll show you. Well, go ahead and show me. Uh, can I get a Polaroid? Can you send it to my iPhone? And God said, No, 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 no. I, I'm going to tell you on the way. Hello? And then when he had promised him a son for 25 years and he was finally born and now he's 13 or 14 and some say as much as 17 years old and God says to him one day, I want you to take Isaac, that son of promise that we waited so long for. You were 75 years old when I promised you a boy and, 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 and you were 100 years old when he was born, 25 years in the making and now he's grown up and it, 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 I have the son of promise and God says, take him on top of Mount Moriah and sacrifice him unto me. And Abraham's like, no, God, you ain't making no sense. And you all ever had that conversation with God and hold up, God? I was cool when you was talking about sacrificing his son or her son. I was cool when you was talking about using their money. I was cool giving their uh, car away. I, I was cool with all that, but God, now you're talking about me. You're talking about my boy. And God said, go worship. And go offer him. So the young boy asked his daddy, he said, Dad, we're going to work. I want you to hear what Abraham told his wife, Sarah. He said, Sarah, I and the lad will go yonder on the mountain and worship. And what is this? Hear the faith. I and the lad shall return. <laughs> Woo! Now, God had already told him to kill him. You got to read Hebrews to understand it. The writer of Hebrews said that Abraham had such a faith in God, he believed if he killed him, God would raise him from the dead. <laughs> hey, praise the Lord. So listen, um, the world's greatest movers and shakers, you know what they did? They, they, they prayed, they planned, but there was a certain day. Just like, you know, in, in our own country, they planned about... D-Day, the invasion, you know, the, uh, you know, they planned that thing and they planned it and, uh, you know, worried to death about this and that and the other and weather turned bad in the night before and uh, all, all of these things, but there come a day when they launched those birds and said, today is the day. We're going to do something. And you say, well, man, couldn't we plan better? You can second-guess yourself until you die. There comes a time when you have got... You know, they say take aim and shoot. One of my pastor's coaches said, sometime you've got to shoot and then take aim. Let me explain that, because I didn't like that at first. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That ain't working out, because if it's a deer, you shoot that, and you shoot the gun, it's over. There ain't going to be no shooting again. you got to make the first one count, unless it's on TV. <laughs> But the, the thought was this. You take the gun and put it on the rest and shoot and see what's going on. We call it grouping. I mean, the bullseye might be right here, but if I'm shooting high and to the right, once I send three down range and I know I'm consistently putting it right here, I say, you know what, man? If I'm going to get this thing right, I just got to come left a few clicks and down a few clicks and I'll be right in there. So I'm not necessarily talking about hunting in that sense, but sometimes you've got to see where you're at. Sometimes you just got to get started and get something going. Instead of saying, well, man, I've planned, I have prepared, I've done boresighted this thing, I've done all that. Nothing really matters until you send one down range and see where you're hitting. <laughs> hey, Lordy. Okay, so the greatest achievers in this world have an insatiable desire to get something done. Um, it, it's almost like God left out that procrastination gene on those people. You've seen people that just, man, in fact, I look at guys like Craig Groeschel, and I don't know where he gets his energy. 
I don't know how in the world he's constantly writing books, uh, how he's constantly, man, he opens a new campus every six months, it seems like. I'm thinking, my Lord, how in the world? And, and I'm trying to learn from some of these guys, and I'm saying, oh, man, I'm overwhelmed. And they understand that I'm not going to have every T crossed and every I dotted, and I'm not going to know everything in totality before we pull the trigger on the project. Listen, that is a trick of the devil to make people waste time forever. I believe in doing due diligence. So anyway, you got to go for it, um, even if you have to be like old Larry Walters and just stop by the Army Navy. And Listen, there's no guarantee about tomorrow. There's no guarantee. As a matter of fact, tomorrow's not going to come. You know why? When tomorrow gets here, we're going to call it today. <laughs> so all we have is today. Because tomorrow will, if it shows up, if the, you know, but the Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day brings forth. But we should say, if the Lord's will, <laughs> if the Lord wills, then I'll do thus and so, you know, and such, such, such. But when tomorrow comes, it will be today. And so all we have is today. So here's the thing. I don't care what your goal is. If it's to become a great entrepreneur, if it's to become a great preacher, if it's to become a great life group leader or a, a nurse or whatever it is, or an author, what steps are you taking today? What little step are you taking today to make it happen? Adam is a great planner. Boy, I'll tell you right now. I, I remember we got two years, three years before we ever built this building. I remember he'd, he'd call me and say, hey, Dad, what did we do today toward the new church? It, it sort of lit a fire with me like, well, I called the bank and said, well, what'd they say? <laughs> uh, well, we, we called, you know, the engineers and, you know, we put a down payment on this or that or the other. But it was like every single day something's got to be planted. Here's the thing. You've got to say, this week, this has got to get accomplished. T tomorrow, this has got to get... And if you will do something every day that matters. Let me give you an example. Have you ever gone to a family reunion or maybe just went home for Christmas or whatever and you hadn't seen your nieces and nephews all year? And when you saw them, you said, holy cow, man, what are y'all drinking? Or eating, I mean, they've grown a foot. And your own children... Your relative said, my goodness, look at little Susie. I mean, she has grown up. And You know why? Because what is right up under our nose, we don't realize the little incremental, gro in incremental growth that our little babies are doing every day. They're getting stronger. They're, they're maturing. They're filling out. They're, they're getting broader. They're getting, you know, uh, more, more and more educated. And we don't see it because it's this little thing. But what I'm saying is this. If consistently, every day, we add another straw to the house, another brick in the wall. If every day we do something, one day the compilation of that will amaze you and the wall will be built. One day you'll look around and say, man, I have I've gathered up all this now. This is incredible. And what happens when you go home for the family reunion, you go for Christmas, you ain't been around them kids since last year. And it was all of a sudden unveiled to you when you walked in the living room and said, my, my, my. And I want to tell you this. If you will stop allowing the devil to bait you into procrastinating about everything, and you say, devil, come hell or high water if it hair lips granny, I'm going to do this on Wednesday. I'm going to do this. Let's say you're trying to build a house. Well, at some point, you've got to go start the permit process, and it stinks. I know I can't stand to deal with all of that. But whether you like it or not, you got to go down there and talk to some people, and you're going to have to give them some money, too. And it's going to be more than you want to give them. But if you're ever going to do it, at some point, you got to go start talking. And then they're going to tell you, you need this, and you need that, and all the other, and you're going to have to have your argument prepared and all that, but you might as well go ahead and sit down and get ready for it. But until you go face the music, and until you ramrod the situation, guess what? Five years will go by, you still ain't built the house. Hello? Ten years ago, let me, let's talk about debt. If you don't direct your dollars, hello, y'all hearing me? If you don't direct those dollars, I, I promise you, 
the bill will not pay itself. You can say, well, I'm on the debt snowball. Well, if you keep piling it up, it's going to take forever to get it all taken care of. Y'all hear me? Say amen. amen. Now, now, I don't know if Kelly's in here, but she can tell you, man, she'll get ill with me sometime. But uh, back when we started our debt snowball deal, I had a card that I owed $8,000. I'm not happy about that I'm, because you don't need to owe a card $8,000, but maybe you do. And, but if you do, you do. So if you owe it, then you just got to pay it. I said, so help me, if it hair lips the devil, I am going to pay that sucker off in two years. I owe $1,100. <laughs> Y'all with me? Man, every time I jump out of an airplane, I'm paying that thing off. Huh? Every time I build a piece of furniture, every time I, whatever it is, man, I'm throwing it to it like nobody's business. And, uh, hey, I called them the other day and said, hey, 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 um, my interest rate is not as good as it ought to be, and I want to know why. I pay all the time, pay way more than I owe, ain't got no bad marks on my credit. Well, we hadn't evaluated your income. I'll I tell you what I'm going to do. If I can't get one of the best rates, I'm going to pay this thing off and go with somebody else that will. Are you with me? Say amen. And I'm a man of my word. That's exactly what I'm doing. But until you make that conversation, hey, it runs in the family. My son, Adam, he called Navy Federal. He said, why don't I have the lowest rate on my credit card? Whoa, 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 whoa. He said, no, no, I know what my credit score is. I know what this is. I know what that is. They dropped it five points. You with me? Say amen. Until you, you can take it all you want to, but until you have the courage to say, this ain't going to last like this. Something is going to change. Nothing will change. All right, let me get on with it. So um, anyway, um, you got to get started somewhere. Things may come to those who wait, but it will only be left over from those who hustle. They said the early bird gets the worm. Amen. At some point, you got to say, I have got to get moving. See, the world rewards you and pays you not because of what you think about, not because of what you plan, but because of what you do. Let me give you an example of our Guatemala trip. We plan it, we think about it, we hope we cover all the bases, and every year, inevitably, there's something that we just did not prepare for. But you know what? The day comes where we load up right out here, drive to Jacksonville and get on an airplane, and there we go. Are you hearing me? And when we get back, we have done what we set out to do. If you're not careful, the devil will talk you into procrastinating until you don't have the health or the strength or the will to go on. You see, um, there's a place for vision, there's a place for goal setting and all of that, but there comes a time where you've got to say, hey, I got to do something. You got to be a man or a woman of action. You know, listen, a thousand mile journey still begins with the first step. Amen? You got to take the first step. And, and action, it, it, it's the key to moving, moving forward. You got to move on. The day will come when you finally start that business that you've talked about. And you know what? Here's something that stops people. They're scared of the risk. They're scared of the risk. You know why? That's why we buy insurance. We're scared we're going to have to owe the hospital $200,000 for stitches in our arm or something. That's about what it costs. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, anyway, that's another story. But risk, that's why we buy insurance. We buy insurance on our automobiles. Well, the government makes us buy it. Uh, unless you drive a motorcycle in Florida or something like that. But anyway, they make us buy insurance so that it's really not about you. It's about like if I hit you, then, then you're covered, the liability side of it. But the insurance is there to insure us against the risk of losing something. Isn't that right? So we're scared to death of taking risk. And ri listen, calculated risks are not that bad. Um. There are people scared to death to do anything. I want to tell you something. There needs to be a healthy tension between planning. Let's think of a heartbeat. Y'all with me? Now, if that thing ever goes 
like this, you're in trouble. Real, real trouble if you don't know Jesus. Huh? There needs to be a tension between that heartbeat. And if the bottom down here represents the planning and the top represents action, there has to be some planning, but there also has to be some action. There needs to be a healthy tension between, well, I said I'm going to do this, and then are you really doing it? That's why everybody needs a coach. Everybody needs somebody to ask them, what are you doing? That's why we need to be accountable for your dreams. You, you, if you've got this dream and you're not doing nothing toward it, it's just a daydream. So there needs to be a healthy tension. If you don't have that, then let me just say this. Please stop thinking that there's going to be a perfect day. I, I believe in planning. Don't get me wrong. Someone says, well, we can't afford to have a child. That may be true. Maybe you don't need to have a child. But if you're waiting on the fact that in your mind one day you're going to afford it, you probably ain't never going to afford it. You know why? Because whatever you make, you adjust your habits to it. And, you know, some of y'all got some fancy tastes. Amen? But when that baby comes along, I'll never forget, man, when Andrew came along, I thought we was through, man. AJ was the end. He was the caboose. I was supposed to have been to see the man that what had the knife. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Brothers, but lo and behold, when my wife said she's late and she wasn't talking about for no appointment, uh, <laughs> are, are you hearing me? And man, me and Jesus had a heart to heart. I called my dad, tried to get some sympathy, and he said, Son, if you had been down by the bed praying instead of in the bed playing. <laughs> <laughs> You wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> that, that's my hand toward heaven. That's exactly what he said. But, but we found a way to feed Andrew. We found a way to buy the clothes. Now, I had to get an extra job along the way. But we found a way to do it. Why? Because once I realized he's in route, I just got to make something happen. I, I can't plan and plan and check my plan. Yeah, we did have some plans, but there come a time when I had to go do something. Lord, let me tie this up. Um, so there's a healthy tension there. Let me say this. You're going to have to take some risk. Um, uh, if you don't take risk, you're in trouble. Let me close with this. Someone described the game of football as 60,000 people who desperately need exercise watching 22 men who desperately need rest. But the game of football is highly indicative of life itself. Most people watch from the sidelines. Few ever really get off the bleachers and get in the game. Sure, there's a few risks, uh, you know, that you might lose. There's a risk that you might fumble the ball. You might sprain your ankle or get a concussion. You might miss a tackle or slip on the wet grass. But nobody scores a touchdown or celebrates in the locker room until somebody faces their fear and suits up and runs onto the field. The goalposts are standing there for the world to see. Sure, the broadcasters and the reporters are waiting for you to make a mistake. You know how it is. Don't you love it? When you're watching football, college football is upon us, brothers and sisters. It's only a month and a half away. And everybody said amen. And I... Sometimes I loathe listening to some commentators because you know who they're rooting for. And then when the, I almost said when the tide turns, but that's not a good term. <laughs> anyway, when things change, when things change, they act like they knew it all the time. Well, I knew old coach had something up his sleeve, you know. I'm thinking, you rascal, you was rooting for them all along. There comes a time when you've got to do something about it. You can't just, just hope that it's going to happen. It won't. You've got to make it happen. Stand with me, if you will. So, Lord, we come to you and thank you for this opportunity.
Thank you for the power of courage. Lord, help us to, to kill that enemy called procrastination, which is the assassin of courage and productivity. Um, Lord, don't let us procrastinate. Give us a check in our spirit every time we try to put off. May we hear the echo again that someday is not one of the days of the week. One day is not one of the days of the week. So when we start thinking of our goals and our dreams and our plans, what day is it? What date on the calendar are we going to accomplish it? Where are we going to hold ourselves accountable? When will we get it done? So, Lord, if we'll do this, we'll make strides in the kingdom and we'll realize the goals that we've set. So help us now in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday.